Congrats, Sebastian. You have my attention. Apparently, inline styles are faster than CSS, both inline CSS as well as traditional CSS in a separate file. I want to know more, though, because this is very, very interesting. So let's take a look at this post. Thank you, Sebastian, for bringing this to my attention. And thank you, Daniel, for writing this. Are inline styles faster than CSS? <laughs> also, the, the AI-generated pic is phenomenal. I kind of want to try and AI-generate an equivalent pic while we're reading in the background. Perfect. You can see the last thing I was trying to generate. Imagine an old couple riding electric scooters going really fast. I'm just curious what we get. Anyways, I recently migrated my website from CSS and JS to inline styles and discovered that inline styles improve the load performance of my website. Based on this discovery, I wrote a blog post suggesting that switching to inline styles could improve a website's performance. When I shared my post on internet forums, people correctly pointed out that migrating from a specific CSS and JS library to inline styles was too ambiguous to suggest that inline styles could actually be faster than CSS. This is fair, and I'm sure when a lot of people saw those numbers, their first thought is like, what are you comparing this to? Styled components? Of course it's faster. Well, let's see, because if I understood that chart correctly, this might even be faster than Tailwind. Oh, mid journey's done. Yeah, these are pretty hilarious. Theirs has a bit of the like stable diffusion look to it, so we're definitely getting this done differently, but fun prompt. Anyways, many people were convinced that CSS was faster than inline styles. In an effort to seek the truth, I decided to conduct a less ambiguous and more conclusive experiment. To perform this experiment, I migrated my website to CSS. Yes, I migrated my entire website to CSS, and yes, it was incredibly tedious. Yeah, once you get deep in like the Tailwind world, going back to the classic like BEM style bullshit just hurts. It hurts so much. Also, I, I we'll, we'll talk about Tailwind performance in a bit because Tailwind is really fast, but we'll get there. I used BEM for styling my components, and I used Atomic CSS for styling elements that were not explicit components. I ended up with a little more than 2,000 lines of handwritten CSS. I built three versions of my React app. The first version was the control using inline styles. So here we have just style equals color blue. Then we have the style sheet as a separate thing that's being referenced that has to be imported. So the second version uses a CSS file. And then the third version inline the CSS in a style tag in the head of the document. I'll refer to this as inline CSS. Fair, I wish there was a better term for this. I would have probably called this embedded CSS. This is a good like ABC test where in one, you're just putting the styles on the element. In one, you have to fetch the CSS file and then load it, which obviously is going to have some amount of performance hit because it's a waterfall. And then the styles being inline in the HTML, well, embedded in the HTML, which should theoretically mean any network penalty you're hitting here gets evaporated immediately. But I am curious what the result ended up being. I deployed all three versions to a single preview environment for testing. I could switch between the different versions using a query parameter in the URL. I then took measurements of the following. Server render time, HTML size, JS bundle size, browser render time, and web vitals. This is an N of 1 experiment, but my website is more complex than a to-do app and more realistic than a synthetic benchmark. Here are the results. Interesting. I didn't expect server render time to be part of this because this could all just be done with like a static HTML file, so to speak, but I'm curious what the results end up being. Server render time. I render my React application on the server and send the pre-rendered HTML to the browser. I measured the time it took to render my application on the server for my homepage and for my blog post about deploying a React app to Vercel. I selected my homepage because it is often the first page my users see. In addition, I selected my blog post about deploying a React app to Vercel because it's my longest blog post to date, and therefore it has the most HTML. I will say, like, does this not skew things against the inline styles and towards the external CSS? Because like, if you have a lot of nodes in a blog post, theoretically you're reusing most of it. But I'm very curious what the result ended up being here. For consistency, I conducted all my experiments using these two pages. Here's some pseudocode for how I measured the time it took to render my app. Classic performance.now checks. Who hasn't done this a bunch? If only he knew about TinyBench. Slight trolling because I've been deep in TinyBench the last few days, but it's a good library. You should check it out. Anyways, I calculated the average render time for each page, and here are the results. We have the home. We have the deploy. These are basically identical. Inline styles was faster for home, and then deploying a React app to Vercel blog post was slightly slower for the CSS versus inline. Yeah, it's doesn't matter is the point. The time it took to render my React app was very inconsistent. However, when I took the average, the times were nearly identical. The reason for the inconsistency is likely I.O. I made some amount of API requests on each page, which is inherently variable in time. However, there was no measurable correlation between inline styles and the time it took to render my application on the server. It would appear that the time it takes to stringify my inline styles is insignificant. This is such a fun flashback to that benchmark that I freaked out over last stream. Yeah, as soon as you're doing anything real inside of your app, remember everybody was saying like 100 to 300 milliseconds was unrealistic for like data loading times? What do you think this is? <laughs> this is a very realistic example of a very realistic app taking a very realistic amount of time to render. 
I'll admit that, since I.O. is happening, this test is not conclusive. It would be better to eliminate all variables. However, for static sites, the rendered HTML could be cached, and in that case, the time it takes to render doesn't matter as much. All fair points. Surprised he bothered including this considering all of that, but good that he called it out. HTML size. Here's a size comparison of the HTML generated by each version of my app. I like that he's comparing gzipped and not gzipped. I say this because something people don't seem to understand about compression is the more things are repeated, the easier it is to compress. If you have like 15 places in your app where you've done flex, gap for, justify center, then that three class name string can be represented by a very small number of characters if it's used all over the place. So even if your HTML looks massive and the file that you generated is massive, once you throw it through gzip and broadly, it might end up being hilariously small. Like the difference between these files is basically nothing at this point. And I bet if you threw Tailwind in here, it might end up being the smallest because of how easy it is to inline and like encode those patterns. I've said this a bunch, but I really want to emphasize that one of the strengths of Tailwind is that when you have a consistent order of your class names, it's very easy to compress that. Yeah, as you see here, once the compression happens, the numbers are pretty nuts. As you might expect, inline styles produce the largest HTML docs. However, after compression, the difference wasn't very significant. What's interesting is that after compression, inline styles produce smaller documents than inline CSS. I believe this is because there is more repetition of inline styles, making them ideal for compression. Yes, all fair points. It is crazy to think inline styles was slightly bigger before, and then after gzip, it becomes way smaller. Again, people freak out over these things because they see this number. They're like, oh my God, why would you do that? And then they check in the browser. They just right click, inspect, and see this huge class name. And they're like, wow, this must be so inefficient. But if you understood the very basics of compression, you'd realize how efficient that could be. The JS bundle size. Oh boy. Here's a size comparison of the JS generated by each version of my app. So we have the total and then after Brotly. Pretty big difference here, but you can see it's still, these are pretty close numbers. I wouldn't read too much into these. Inline styles did increase the size of my JS bundle, but again, after compression, the difference was insignificant. Remarkably, styling my entire website using inline styles only increased my JS bundle by one kilobyte after my compression. That is hilarious because you also have to then load a whole additional CSS file that you don't have to load when everything's inline. So you have one additional kilobyte of broadly JS but get to skip the whole CSS file that he said was 2,000 lines. So that sounds like a win to me. I want to point out that the size of my CSS file, minified and brought lead, is 8.9 kilobytes. That means inline styles actually resulted in the fewest bytes over the wire, at least for the first page visit before anything is cached in the browser. I do not currently code split my JS, but if I did, then inline styles would naturally get chunked up as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's better. It's funny because everybody's always said like inline styles are the devil and like terrible for performance and all these things, but are they really? Because it seems like this is better in every sense so far. Browser render time. Now let's have a look at browser render performance for each version. For these tests, I allowed the browser to cache the CSS file. I think this is very generous. I don't think this is necessary for like, yeah, the first time you load a website, you download the CSS and now it's cached for all future visits. But is it? If you make a new deployment, chances are your CSS file has some hash on the end of it. And in here, I will load the CSS, go to sources. So you'll see that this file name isn't just 404.css, it's 404.allthisnonsense.css. This additional nonsense is a hash. And every time I make a new build, that hash gets changed and you have to reload it. So if I did basically nothing, I didn't even change the styles of my site, I just changed the text for one of these things, it's gonna create a new build, it's gonna create a new CSS, and then every user has to load it again. So as much as we like to, to say these things are cached, and in the end, a lot of them are, a lot of them also aren't, and that's, annoying. There will always be a user at some point that's not hitting the cache, and that user is going to hit that more often than you probably would expect. Even though I don't agree with the idea of ignoring that the CSS file has to be loaded, the results still are pretty absurd here, where, yeah, the inline CSS and the inline styles are quite a bit faster. It seems like this additional style step that happens here is very slow, almost as slow as the whole layout step in inline and in both inline cases. Very interesting. And that's also just the home. Let's check out home fork slowdown. A good bit closer. I, my suspicion there is that the slowdown only affects certain things and not others. So it might not be the most realistic test here. Let's see the blog post though. Interesting that inline styles is still in the lead and actually beats out inline CSS there. But when you turn the Forex slowdown, it looks a lot worse, which is interesting. I also noticed the Forex slowdown hat like repeats steps throughout here. Yeah, very interesting. So let's let's read more. 
Parse, style, layout, and paint are stages of the browser's rendering pipeline. It is how it turns HTML into pixels. The chart shows how long it took for the browser to render each page once it started parsing the HTML. It also shows the frequency and the time spent in each stage of the rendering pipeline. While inline styles weren't always the fastest way to render the entire page, they were consistently the fastest to put pixels on the screen. This can be seen by looking for the first paint indicator in the chart. Yeah, first paint there was the fastest. First paint here was fast by quite a bit. Slowdown, wow. Yeah, time to first paint, especially with these arbitrary slowdowns, is very, very good with inline styles. There are a couple interesting observations from this data. The first observation is that for small pages like my homepage, a fast computer may parse the HTML before it parses the CSS, even from the cache. If you look closely at the CSS timeline for my homepage, you'll see a second blue bar. This is the browser parsing the CSS. It can't render anything until it's parsed the CSS because the CSS is render blocking. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, you do see that second blue bar where this has to parse again. And that's what I was mentioning earlier, where once it has to go through the CSS file, it takes so much longer and it's actually blocking the paint all through that. So it renders, can't do anything, then it loads the CSS, then it can start doing the layout work, then it can paint. It, the thought that this would take, like this is just the timer for once the page has like loaded content, that that would take 85 milliseconds. Like if you're on a 60 FPS screen, that's 16.6. That's five frames until you actually see the page from when it's loaded. That's a bit absurd. The other interesting observation is that the browser, well, at least Chrome, appears to parse HTML for roughly 10 milliseconds before attempting to ship a frame. For inline CSS, the browser may need to process multiple chunks of HTML before it finishes parsing that CSS. Furthermore, both CSS and inline CSS appear to tax first paint. This is especially noticeable on lower powered devices. This makes sense. If you give the browser a wall of CSS, it has to cut through all that CSS before it can render anything. All very fair points. Web Vitals. To round things out, let's compare Web Vitals for each version of my app. To measure Web Vitals on my own device, I use the Web Vitals NPM package maintained by Google. I didn't realize Google was actually the maintainers of the Web Vitals NPM package. Good to know. For these tests, I was connected to my home Wi-Fi and I allowed the browser to cache the CSS files. I will personally say, if you can, for tests like this, use Ethernet. Your Wi-Fi is not consistent enough to do these tests. Use Ethernet if you can. Wi-Fi has way too many variables that you cannot control for. We'll still look at these numbers. I am very curious. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Wi-Fi wouldn't account for gaps of that size and that consistency either. Yeah, that FCP difference is insane. That's like 130 millisecond gap from inline styles to inline CSS. And the CSS file is still a 50 millisecond gap there. And again, he allowed the browser to cache the CSS files. If you didn't do that, this would look even worse, which is a terrifying thought. Wild. More often than not, inline styles outperformed CSS when it came to first contentful paint and largest contentful paint. This is consistent with the data for the render performance. There wasn't a measurable correlation between inline styles and first input delay, or an interaction to next paint. Good old pile of the different points at which you can measure how a page's loading performance works. Let me know in the comments if you think I should do a dedicated video about FCP, LCP, INP, FID, all of the chaos that is measuring a page's performance at load times. Both inline styles and CSS were well below the 200 millisecond threshold to feel instantaneous. Another really fun and cool rule is when you click something, it should take less than 200 seconds to see and feel a difference. Otherwise, things don't feel responsive. Now let's take a look at Lighthouse and page speed insights to see if this trend continues. Whew, that's a gap. That's a pretty significant gap, actually. That's like half the time for FCP, according to Lighthouse Desktop. Blog post isn't as big of a gap, but the home page, that's like, that's insane. That's actually crazy. I did not expect it to be that big of a deal. Jesus. Whew, are you kidding? Seven second LCP on Lighthouse Mobile to load a blog post. No, this isn't even the blog post. This is the home page. How about the blog post? <laughs> are you kidding? Nine seconds for the full content paint. No way. That's insane. That's actually insane. Is it like a, a picture or something? I need, I need information. There appears to be a slight advantage to inline styles and inline CSS compared to CSS on desktop. However, on mobile, there's a significant advantage to inline styles and inline CSS compared to CSS. It's not, it's, I would have called this significant. Like 0.7 to 0.9 is significant. But yeah, the mobile difference is insane. <laughs> Jesus. Both Lighthouse and PageSpeed Insights show horrible performance for CSS on mobile. This is inconsistent with the data I've collected from my own devices. I believe this is because when they conduct their tests, the browser's cache is empty and the network speed is throttled. Yeah, but I think this is fair. My gut here is that there's an image on this blog post, which we can actually go check. Let's go to his blog and find the deploying article. My assumption here is this picture is being loaded during it. 
We could even run our own lighthouse quick and take a look and see. Analyze page load. Huh. There is no frame that comes in without the image. Is the image inlined or something? Like, how is this? No, it's loading the actual asset. Hmm. Very interesting. Weird. I, I would normally dig into that more, but I'm trusting my gut on that. That the site is blocking until the image is loaded, and the image loading is one of the bigger slowdowns here. And I'm also, I should check the homepage actually, too. Let's do that because I'm assuming the homepage has no images. Okay, it does, but those aren't going to block LCP because they're below the fold. Let's see what his conclusion is because I'm scared, more scared than ever. I'm going to go rewrite all my stuff inline. <laughs> there were no measurable correlations between inline styles and the time it took to render my React application on the server. In addition, while inline styles did increase the size of my HTML and JS, the difference was insignificant after compression. In fact, inline styles resulted in the fewest bytes total for the browser to download, at least on first page visit. Furthermore, using inline styles, the browser is able to start painting pixels earlier in the rendering process. This is especially true on mobile or on lower powered devices. Over time, CSS will increase in size as more features are added to a website. This will negatively impact performance on existing pages. Also, very true point, unless you're doing crazy stuff with the splitting and creation of your CSS files, this is real. Tailwind does a good job of like, am I gonna Excalibur draw? So if we have like size of CSS per page, and we'll have like amount of content. So the amount of content could be like the number of components with unique styles. They could be the number of like blog posts on your blog. It can be a lot of different things. And the size of the CSS is the amount of CSS that has to be loaded in order to view the page in the first place. So we'll start with good old vanilla. And with vanilla, it's not, I'll say it's linear-ish. So we'll call this vanilla CSS. It's, it's hard to say, call anything vanilla CSS. Now I think about it, we'll call this uh, one CSS file is what we'll call this, which is, in my opinion, relatively traditional. It's what we see on a lot of sites. At least that's like how the bundlers work behind the scenes. And with that, as you introduce more and more content as more and more requirements, the amount of CSS that you need grows exponentially. With inline styles, it starts a bit higher. It, it, the CSS size is a hard thing to measure here too, actually. So I don't even know how I would, would put that, I guess. Since it's just what the page needs, it would be a bit lower. So to be fair, we'll do like that. We'll call this inline. This shouldn't be blue because I need to use blue for something else in a moment. So we'll make this green. I also want to better represent the gap here. So I'll move this up a little. This is meant to be very relative, by the way, in case that wasn't clear before I get fleeced by L. This is the point I wanted to make, though. And I love the, the way that this tool works in Excalibur until I don't. But here's the magic of something like Tailwind. With Tailwind, it might start with a bit more CSS for like your core stuff, but those things get reused so heavily across your application that it barely matters. Like once you have a lot of content, you've probably used most, if not all of the main Tailwind classes and the likelihood that new ones get introduced to your bundle is very low because it doesn't matter how many places in your code base you have the word flex. It only loads that CSS file one time in your CSS. Honestly, inline's an unfair thing to put here, more I think about it. Ugh. Yeah, I guess that for this, I'd, something that's a little more fair would be CSS modules, where different routes load different CSS depending on what it, components are and aren't mounted. It comes with its own pile of potential crutches, but I think this fairly represents the point I'm trying to make. Don't screenshot this and post it on Twitter. Don't try and cancel me for being wrong here. The point that I'm trying to emphasize is that over time, if all your CSS goes one place, as you add more things to your code base, this gets way worse. With CSS modules, it can get less bad as you add new things, but it's still every page you add is introducing more CSS. And as certain things end up in the global inherently, the load time per page is inherently going to go up. With Tailwind, same deal. I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but the amount goes down as your code base gets larger. And eventually you hit a threshold where you're basically never adding new Tailwind classes to your CSS. You get the idea. I would put StyleX in here, but StyleX is its own crazy complex thing. Watch my video about that if you're curious, because I think it's an interesting piece that fits into this puzzle in strange ways. Over time, CSS will increase in its size as more features are added to a website. This will negatively impact performance of existing pages. Yes. Based on the data, I believe there is evidence to suggest that inline styles are better for performance than CSS. However, this may not be true for every website. I encourage people to do their own experiments and seek their own truth. The more data we collect, the more we will understand. That is fair. I will say that generally, as soon as your JS isn't the thing doing the CSS work, the gaps here don't tend to be that big. I'm a little terrified by the numbers we saw here, but otherwise, I don't think this is worth making big changes over. As interesting as it is to see that inline styles perform so much better, I don't think it matters too much in the end. And you should pick the CSS solution that fits your needs the best, especially if that solution isn't CSS and JS.
I'd love to see like styled components or something thrown in here to compare with the others. But you get the idea. That's all I have on this one. And until next time, peace nerds.